You've all heard of waves, right? Microwaves, for example? Microwaves are just one of the hundreds of different kinds of waves out there, and today you get to learn about what makes waves so special in the first place. The point of a wave is to carry energy from one place to another, without the physical particles that get it there having an overall displacement or movement. So how can this work? Think about a highway. On a highway, a car, the energy, moves along, but the road itself doesn't move from one place to another. In a wave, particles aren't displaced, but energy is. All waves are either transverse or longitudinal. Transverse waves look like this. You can think of a transverse wave as being like ocean waves. The particles move up and down, but the energy moves, let's say, from left to right. Transverse waves are made up of high points called crests and low points called troughs. The height of a crest or trough is called the amplitude. The difference between two crests or two troughs is called the wavelength. Now let's look at a longitudinal wave. In these waves, the particles and the energy both move horizontally. Longitudinal waves are like what you get when you stretch back a slinky. Where the slinky bunches together, we have a point of compression, and where it stretches, we have rarefaction. Basically, longitudinal waves are like looking down at transverse waves from above. No matter whether or not a wave is transverse or longitudinal, there's a few important equations you need to be able to use. Let's look at a part of a transverse wave. Even though this transverse wave just goes on and on and on, we can cut out a chunk of it, like we have here, and that will represent one complete wave. The period of that wave is how long it takes for that single chunk to go past one point. Let's say that the period of this wave is two seconds. The frequency of that very same wave is how many of those chunks are going to go past every second. We just told you that the period of the wave is 2 seconds, which means that one wave goes past every 2 seconds. Obviously then, the frequency of the wave must be less than 1. We can use this equation to relate period and frequency. f equals 1 over t, where f is the frequency of the wave measured in hertz, hz, and t is the period measured in seconds. This equation basically tells us that the larger the period gets, the longer one wave takes to pass, then the smaller the frequency will be. And it makes sense. What if the period was only 0.5 seconds? Suddenly there's enough time for two waves to go past in one second, so the frequency will be 2 hertz. We've already explained that the wavelength is the distance from crest to crest, or from trough to trough. You know, it looks like this. The symbol lambda is used for wavelength, which is just measured in meters, even though lots of waves have tiny wavelengths. If we take the wavelength and we multiply it by the frequency of the wave, which remember is how many waves go past each second, then we actually end up with the speed of that wave. This special wave equation looks like this. The wave speed equals the frequency times the wavelength. So let's say that the frequency of our wave is 2 hertz. Let's go on and say that we've been told that the wavelength is 5 meters. To find the speed, we just chuck these numbers into the equation. v equals 2 times 5, so v must equal 10 meters per second. Since frequency equals 1 divided by the period, t, we can substitute that into v equals f lambda to get v equals lambda divided by t, which is exactly the same as v equals d divided by t. Since the wavelength is the distance traveled, and it's over a period of time. Imagine a ray of light heading towards a mirror. When light, or some other kind of wave, hits a mirror, it gets reflected at the same angle that it struck the mirror at. We use a line that's at a right angle to the mirror to measure that angle. That line is called the normal. The wave that's coming in is called the incident wave, and the wave that's going out is called the reflected wave. So we say the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Waves don't only get reflected when they hit something though. When a wave gets reflected, none of the wave passes through the boundary. Lots of times, however, at least part of the wave will pass through the boundary, and when this happens, we say that the wave has been refracted. So wave 1 has travelled through medium 1 at a speed of velocity 1 at an angle of theta 1. When it gets refracted, it passes through the boundary and into medium 2, 
but there's no reason why its angle of refraction, theta 2, should be the same as theta 1. In fact, here you can see that the wave has been bent toward the normal. When a wave is refracted, its velocity and wavelength change, but its frequency always stays the same. What's the idea of refractive index about? Well, it basically tells us how quickly the wave will move in that medium. The higher the refractive index, the slower the wave moves, since a higher refractive index means a more dense medium. Think about how much slower you walk through water compared to through air. And when waves slow down, their angle from the normal gets smaller, and so they get bent towards the normal. We use Snell's law to work out the angles. N1 sine of theta1 equals N2 sine of theta2. So let's say that a wave is travelling through air, which has a refractive index of 1, and into water, which has a refractive index of 1.33, at an initial angle of 18 degrees. This exact kind of situation happens whenever you look into a glass of water, because the waves being refracted will be light waves. We can say already that the angle is going to have to decrease, because waves move slower in water than air. We can use this equation to figure out how much the angle drops by. n1 times sine of theta1 equals n2 times sine of theta2. So 1 times the sine of 18 degrees equals 1.33 times sine of theta2. Rearranging and solving, we get theta2 equals 13.4 degrees. If we know the refractive indices of the mediums, and the velocity or wavelength of the wave in one of the mediums, we can figure out some more stuff using n1 divided by n2 equals v2 divided by v1, and n1 divided by n2 equals lambda2 divided by lambda1. For the above example, the speed of light in air is 299,700,000 meters per second. So to find out the speed of light in water, we rearrange the above equation to get v2 equals v1 times n1 divided by n2 equals 299,700,000 times 1 divided by 1.33 equals 225,338,346 meters per second. For water waves moving from deep water to shallow water, we treat it as though the shallow water has a higher refractive index than the deep water. Therefore, the wavelength and velocity will decrease. Remember that frequency stays the same, and the direction of the wave bends towards the normal. Let's say we're now only looking at what happens when waves travel from a slower medium to a faster one. In other words, we only care about waves moving from a high refractive index to a lower one. Let's say we've taken some waves in water and aimed them at the air. We choose an angle and we end up with this. So the wave has been refracted because it has passed right through the water and into the air. Since it's speeding up, it will always bend away from the normal, and so theta 2 has to be greater than theta 1. Now, let's say we increase the angle theta 1, just a wee bit. If everything goes according to plan, then if we increase it to just the right point, we end up with this. This is a very special angle. It's called the critical angle, or theta c. At the critical angle, the light suddenly stops passing through the water-air boundary. But it doesn't quite get reflected either. Instead, it moves along the boundary, and so theta 2 is exactly 90 degrees. Let's find the critical angle for a wave passing from water into air using Snell's law. OK, so what do we know that can help us out here? We know that theta 2 needs to be exactly 90 degrees. We also know that n2 is 1 because it's just air, and n1 is 1.33 because the original substance is water. Let's fill the equation in, and then we can work out what theta 1 will be. 1.33 times the sine of theta 1 equals the sine of 90 degrees. So 1.33 times sine of theta 1 equals 1. Rearranging and solving, we get theta 1 equals 48.8 degrees. And there you have it. OK, so let's make that angle just a tiny bit larger once again. Suddenly, because of that extra angle we added on, 
all of the wave gets reflected and nothing passes outside of the water. You can try this too. If you're in a pool, get really close to the surface and look along the water's edge. Chances are you won't be able to see anything outside the water. This is called total internal reflection. So if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, total internal reflection will occur. If the angle of incidence is smaller than the critical angle, refraction will occur. Remember these only apply when a wave is travelling from a medium with a higher refractive index to a medium with a lower one. When one wave is on top of another, there are two main possibilities. The first is that the crests of the top wave line up with the crests of the bottom wave, like this. When we get a situation like this, we say that the two waves are in phase. Whenever waves are on top of each other like they are here, they will add together. When two waves that are in phase get added together, each of their amplitudes get added. Here that means the overall wave would have crests that are twice as high as the smaller waves, and troughs that are twice as low. The opposite of two waves that are in phase are two waves that are exactly out of phase. In exactly out of phase waves, the crest of one wave sits right above the trough of another wave. The overall wave can be found by adding the amplitude of the waves. Since one is negative relative to the other, we end up subtracting. If they're identical, then we end up with no wave at all. See? Whenever we add waves that come into contact with each other, we say that the waves are interfering. When they're in phase, we call this constructive interference, because they add together. On the other hand, we call the waves that are out of phase destructive interference, because the overall wave gets smaller. We also run into constructive and destructive interference when we have two waves from a single point source that are interfering with each other. A point source means that all of the waves begin at a single point. The best way of making point source waves is to drop a pebble into water. Where the pebble hit is where the waves emanate from. If you look down on the waves from above, you'll see something like this. The thick black lines are the crests of the waves, and the grey lines are the troughs. If we drop two pebbles into the water at the exact same time, we get two sets of crests and troughs that will interfere. Where the crests hit the crests, where the black meets the black, we get an especially large crest. This is obviously constructive interference, and we call these points antinodes. We get more antinodes where troughs meet other troughs, and the overall trough will be especially low. On the other hand, wherever a crest meets a trough, or a trough meets a crest, we've got destructive interference, or a node. At nodes, the waves cancel, and we don't get any movement on the water at all. It will be perfectly flat. The nodes and antinodes will be in special patterns of straight lines, like this. Imagine we've got some water waves that are heading in a straight line directly towards a wall in the ocean. Don't ask why there's a wall in the ocean, okay? There just is. Each of the lines we've drawn is one of the crests of the waves. Now obviously, if these waves hit this wall, there's not much chance they're going to pass through it, assuming the wall is pretty high. In fact, they'll probably be reflected, but let's not worry about that right now. It turns out the wall was pretty poorly built, and there's actually a hole in it. What happens when the waves pass through that hole? The waves get bent as they come out the other side. The closer the wavelengths of the waves are to the size of the gap, the more the waves will be bent. For diffraction around an object rather than through a gap, for example, water waves diffracting around a large rock in the ocean, the longer the wavelength, the greater the diffraction will be around each edge of the object. Remember, Waves reflect at the same angle as the incident angle. We use Snell's law to determine the values of refraction. A wave refracted above the critical angle will undergo total internal reflection. Waves in phase are constructive, whereas waves out of phase are destructive. And waves travelling through a slit will be diffracted.